Okay, so uh, welcome back to uh, It's a Brain Thing. Um, appreciate you guys coming to the meeting. It seems kind of silly to give this to such few people but tonight, but, uh, but we'll do the best we can. And then again, we're filming it, so it'll be on the internet and on TV as well. And so a lot of people can watch it at home in the, pri in the privacy of their own home. You know, tonight um, I was going to do a little different talk than I have. But usually I've, I talk in the last few times, the last probably several times, I've talked about different illnesses of the brain that folks can have. When, when something goes wrong with the brain, you know. Um, tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of the normal development of the brain and some of the normal things that our brain does that, that again, that we take for granted. I talk about a lot of the stuff that, that we take for granted in here, but uh, tonight will be some other kind of interesting things that I, hopefully will be interesting to you guys as well. Since we all have a brain, it seems kind of neat to know about it as much as we can anyway. Um, first of all, you know, a little background about the brain is, is that you know, I think most people realize that it's made up of a lot of what we call nerve cells. Uh, there's also other cells in the brain that are even more common or more numerous than, than, the, than the neurons and the nerve cells. But the nerve cells are the ones that do sort of the work of the brain, the thinking of the brain, okay? And there are about 200 billion of these things um, when we're born. And then as adults, we have about 100 billion. So these are averages. But as you can tell, you know, somewhere along the line, we lose, we lose some. And of course, after the age of 25 or 30, you start to lose more than you gain. Uh, but you still gain as you age. So these nerve cells, uh, they, they sort of connect with each other to, make, to form circuits. And then those circuits are kind of you know, responsible for different functions of the brain. So um, we'll talk about some of those. We have talked about some of those before with some of the illnesses. Some of those circuits can... can uh, uh, not function like they should, and then you'll end up with things like obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, dementia, depression, uh, psychosis. So um, that's kind of a way to conceptualize the brain. And so, so let's talk for a second about how do these connections get made, okay? And the way I sort of think about it is when a baby's born, there are some connections, but not a whole lot. And it's, I think of it sort of like a, uh, the brain is like a piece of clay at that point. And really the environment, all of us, are the sculptors of that clay, okay? So that child is going to be directly influenced by, by, by you know, the, the interactions that the child has with the environment, which is you know, a lot of times it's mom, dad, grandparents, that kind of thing. Um, so grandparents are very important, uh, to just as much as parents are, I think, especially if they're around the child a lot. So <clears throat> when, are the, when are these connections that, are, that I was talking about in the brain, when are these circuits and these connections being formed to the, to the greatest degree? It appears that between the ages of six and eight is when they're being uh, laid down as fast as they can be laid down. So um, if you think about it, that's a really important time for kids. You know, that's when their brain is growing and putting down connections. And so that's the time you don't want the child just to veg in front of the TV for hours a day. You know, you want the child to do lots of different things and expose, get exposed to a lot of things in the environment so that they basically um, lay down these connections. Um, you know, when are these things, when, are the, when is the brain sort of the most dense with the, no, the most number of connections? Well, it's the same period of time, around the ages of 6 to 10. And it's also the time when, when if you look at the brain and how much energy it's using, how much uh, sugar and oxygen and stuff that it's using, it's also between the ages of 6 and 10. So, as you can tell, those are sort of critical, critical uh, developmental uh, periods for the brain. Um, now, how do these connections form? I talked to you a second about the environment, but it's also probably some genetics, right? So there are some brain cells that uh, are predetermined to do certain things, uh, to be, let's say, a motor nerve cell or a sensory nerve cell or something like that. So there's some genetic uh, blueprint, if you will, as to what these nerve cells are supposed to do, but then the environment also may, plays a big role in, them, in, what they're, in what's going to happen. Certain things can interfere with it. So if, uh, if something, let's say mom, who's such a big part of a child's development anyway, but let's say mom has a mental illness like depression or has some physical illness and is not really available for that child, now that can really interfere with the child's brain development and these connections being made, but also things in the environment like, uh, like drugs or smoke, stress, um, basically lack of stimulation also can interfere. So. Uh, if you took a child, uh, this would be kind of cruel to do this, but if you took a child and put them in isolation where there wasn't anything to see or hear, no stimulation at all, um, they would basically develop without these abilities. So they would be blind, they wouldn't be able to hear, they, wouldn't, they would be almost, it'd be like mentally retarded with, with a lot of other things that were wrong too. And the reason is because, as I said, the brain needs the environmental input 
to develop. Um, you know, and we'll talk for a second about the blindness. I got another example to give you about that. Um, we also think there are certain windows of time that the brain is, uh, that if you, if you stimulate the brain a certain way during that window of opportunity, during a certain age, let's say, um, the brain can develop that ability. And if you miss that window, the brain will never develop that ability. It can't. An example of that is language. So between the age of 6 and 12 months, if you um, uh, are exposed to certain sounds of certain languages, you can remember those from, from then on. But if you're, if you're not exposed to those things, you'll never, be, never, never develop that ability. An example is um, uh, folks, let's say a, a, a person that's uh, Japanese, uh, if they're exposed to the English sounds of R and L uh, between the age of 6 and 12 months, then they'll be able to tell the difference between those two letters. It, on the other hand, if they're not, if they miss that window, they never hear those two sounds, they will not be able to tell the difference between the words rake and lake. They sound the same to them. So that's fascinating if you think about it. I mean, there's, that means that, there's a, that, that, there, that the brain is very plastic, but at certain times it's plastic, and in certain areas it's plastic, and it's able to, you know, to change with the environment. But then after you, you miss that window, you can't do that anymore. So it's, it's very, uh, very interesting to think about. Three, at three months, um, the visual cortex has, has and then the visual cortex in the back part of the brain, okay? We've talked about this, I think, before, but for vision, you don't, and sound and everything else, it's not just the eyes that are involved, right? The eyes take in the information, but it's the brain that interprets that information and tells you what you see and, and the different characteristics about what you see. If you take a, um, an animal, baby animal, and this sounds kind of cruel, but it's, it, it, we learned a lot from doing experiments like this, but you take a baby animal and you blindfold that animal during these, uh, these formative years, you know, and, and I don't know, for the animal, I don't remember what kind of animal it was, but, but um, it was sort of like the equivalent of three months for a child, up to three months, and so you blindfold it and basically no input then goes in. The eyes are normal now, but the, child, the, the baby animal becomes blind, and it's because the, the visual cortex, part of the brain, didn't get any input, so it never, it never, never knew what it was to see anything. So it didn't develop like it should. Um, kind of fascinating stuff. So there are these windows that if you miss the windows, you know, you, there's, uh, there's some uh, permanent type damage. That, that, or not damage, I wouldn't say damage, really. It's not that that part of the brain was damaged. It wasn't, it's not that it worked, it wasn't working like it should. It just didn't get the input it needed. It had to have the, the environmental input of what the, the animal or the, the person would see to be able to, you know, to, to wire up the way it should, so it never wired up like it should. Um, we talked about that stimulating, you know, a stimulating environment is a good thing for a child, and that is true. Um, I will say, though, that it has to be kind of a happy medium. So you can't sit your child down and, uh, you know, just barrage information at it left and right, you know, just talk to, let, talk to the child left and right, and, you know, well, here's math, and here's all this stuff, you know. After a while, the child's going to get overstimulated, and that's not so good. Then they get kind of stressed out. They, they're real young, you know, they're infants and all, they'll start to cry and get colicky and things. So you don't want to uh, overstimulate, but you don't want to understimulate under either. So there's got to be a happy medium. And probably for every child, there's, there's, uh, it's different, it may be different. Um, which of course makes teachers' jobs quite hard because each child in that room is going to have a different attention span and a different amount of information that it can take in before taking a break. Um, you know, even us as adults, when we're trying to learn something, you know, sitting through the through, sitting through a lecture like this for an hour and, and you know getting all the information that you can get out of it, that's pretty challenging. Most folks can't do that. So, you know, as you can as you can see, you know, even with kids, it's the same thing. They can't sit there and just listen and listen and take it all in forever. There's got to be some time for them to to um, uh, you know sort of assimilate that information. Um, some another interesting thing is if uh, if you stress a child out too much and it starts having trouble sleeping, um, one of the things that we do in sleep is we take short-term memories and convert them into longer-term memories. So that can you know if you interfere with sleep, you can you can end up causing some problems with memory in, in kids, um, and they don't learn as much you know because they'll they'll put it into short-term memory, but it'll never get into long-term memory. So they learn two plus two is four, but then they forget it right away. So 